Good afternoon, everyone. So um, I'm going to keep my presentation a little bit short because Dr. Sunny Handa is actually a professor of law at University of McGill. So he has to uh, go teach a class immediately after this presentation. So just to keep it brief, uh, our next presenter, I'm really proud to be introducing him. His name is Dr. Sunny Handa. He is a partner at Blake's. And he will be talking to us today on the topic of copyright in the digital world. And it will include relevant um, recent amendments to the Copyright Act and how, uh, how it had to, came to deal with uh, copyright and digital um, copyright material. So without further ado, I now present uh, Dr. Sunny Handa. Thank you very much. Uh, my apologies for having to run out of here, but uh, my running will be abrupt, so I'll try to give you some time for questions at the end, but if I do run out, uh, again, my apologies in advance. Um, my presentation today, is, uh, as you heard, deals with copyright in the digital world. Uh, I've got a couple of ambitious goals uh, over the next um, 45 minutes or so. Uh, the first is to try to get everybody on the same page with respect to copyright. I understand some of you are lawyers, some of you come from industry, some from government, might have different understandings of copyright, so I will spend a few minutes on copyright basics. Uh, apologies for those who are more advanced. And then I'm going to spend the rest of my time dealing with the recent copyright amendments, the C11 amendments uh, that are now law. Uh, and particularly those that deal with digital uh, rights. Uh, this was known as the Digital Rights Bill, so there were a lot of amendments. Uh, they're important. Uh, they reshape a lot of uh, what it is uh, copyright lawyers do, uh, and uh, as well as IT lawyers who are, are really the transactional uh, copyright lawyers. So let's start off with the basics. At its very basic uh, level, copyright law is one of the uh, uh, I guess members of the bucket of intellectual property rights, others include patent rights, trademark rights, et cetera, um, that applies to a range of different uh, materials. I, I often liken copyright as the sort of, uh, uh, sort of the garbage can of, of rights in the sense that whenever a right isn't so pure as to fit within the patent scheme or the trademark scheme, but we feel it needs protection, we shove it into copyright. Copyright didn't start out that way, of course. It started out as protecting books and literary rights. Uh, but today, uh, it protects a range of things, music, uh, as we all know, uh, dramatic works, uh, so whether it's a play or a television program or a movie. Uh, and, and for our purposes at a conference such as this, of course, it protects computer programs as literary works, uh, and it also protects databases as works of compilation. Now, an important thing about all intellectual property uh, laws, for those who are not terribly familiar, they are national in scope. There is no international copyright law. Uh, there is no international patent law. There are treaties that harmonize these laws and try to bring up a base sort of standard um, so that different member countries, for example, of the NAFTA, of the WTO, will respect those uh, uh, basic levels of protection but there is no inter international enforcement of copyright. And so it's important to understand that the rights you have here in Canada, where you might have created a software program, are not the same rights that you would necessarily have in the United States. You would still be protected under their copyright law, but you might have different rights, rights that vary slightly uh, from the rights you have uh, in your home country. Again, with the basics, it, copyright subsists upon the creation uh, of a work. Uh, you don't really need to do anything to get copyright protection. This is, of course, different from patents, uh, as an example, uh, or industrial rights protection. Uh, trademarks are sort of a hybrid. You have a trademark upon use of a trademark, but if you want stronger protection, you register. Copyright protection is not terribly enhanced by registration. There is a registration scheme. It assists you during litigation in obtaining 
damage awards in certain cases, but it is not mandatory. Uh, and that is really the world standard. So once you create something in Canada, it's nice to know you have copyright protection in many of the industrial, in fact, all of the industrialized countries and in many countries around the world, according to their national standard, of course. How do you get copyright protection to work? As I said, you create something that is protectable. It has to fit within the prescribed uh, range of works that copyright protects, which are pretty broad, literary, dramatic, artistic, musical, works of compilation, broadcast signals are, are protected, sound recordings are protected, and performers' performances are protected. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways to get protection under the Copyright Act. The work has to be original, and it has to be fixed in some form uh, that cannot be merely transitory in nature. What does that mean? Well, for years, it, the question was, if it's stored in RAM or flash memory, is that transitory? Because if I turn off the power, it's gone. That's a nice theoretical question, and I might ask it of a student on an exam uh, at a law school, but the reality is it tends not to come up in the real world. Most of the time, people create things, they store it on a disk, a hard disk, uh, you know, uh, flash, uh, flash memory that is more or less permanent, uh, um, et cetera. So y you typically don't have a fixation issue. Originality is a little different. Different countries have different standards of originality to get protection. So what that means is uh, in the United States, a modicum of creativity is enough to satisfy originality. Just a modicum. I'm not sure what that is, but it's something really small. Uh, in Canada, you have to exercise some skill and judgment in the creation of a work. Um, and in European countries, more the continental European countries, France, Germany, a higher level of creativity is required for protection in that country. Again, with most things, this doesn't come up because most things pass the threshold. If I write an essay, if I write a song, if I perform a song, these typically past the threshold quite easily of copyright protection. Who owns it? Well, the author of a work is presumed to be the first owner of the work, except in situations of employment. Very important that the situation of employment be a true employment relationship, not a contract for services. In other words, what is a true, well, what is a true employment relationship? Withholding taxes possibly benefits. You go to a place where you work under the control and supervision of somebody else. You're using their work tools, not your own tools. To the extent that you don't necessarily meet all of those tests, you should be a little nervous as to who is going to own the work that the person who is creating the work creates. So who's going to own it? Um, and if there is any nervousness, how do you take care of it? Simple. You confirm this you confirm ownership in a contract. So it's important to confirm ownership in a contract. And I always say, even in situations of employment, you should always have an employment agreement. I don't think that's rocket science for anyone. Um, and, and you should talk about ownership of works that are created. So what works do you get when you create something? Uh, many, 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 many different rights, and that's where things get really messy and complicated. Um, I would eat up my entire 45 minutes if we were to try to engage in a profound discussion of um, an example where I have a web page and I want to take a piece of music and put it up on that web page, and then for people to download and or stream as to who has the rights, how do I clear the rights, it's complicated. There are many, many different rights holders so people who own rights, performers might have rights in a performance of the musical work. That would be Celine Dion, for example, singing a song. The sound recording maker, which is typically the record label, would have rights in it. Um, if, uh, there is, um, if it's performed publicly, then you're going to get collective rights societies, such as SOCAN, that would get involved. Unless it's a download, then you'd have SODRAC or the CMRRA. So my point is there are many different people that can own rights in the song. And of course, oh, I forgot the composer. I don't know if Celine Dion writes her own music. I'm going to assume not always. Therefore, whoever composed uh, the music would have rights. And then they have different rights. They have rights of reproduction. 
They have rights of translation. They have rights of dramatization. They have rights of telecommunication to the public. Uh, many, many different examples of rights. So if you were to draw a matrix or a graph of all the possible right holders and rights, it's going to be a pretty big box with a lot of different check marks in it. If you want to start using these works, therefore you have a complicated sort of set of steps to go through, and that's one of the problems with copyright. The clearance of copyright rights does raise transaction costs, costs, real costs, to people who want to use a work. Um, and, and those are not immaterial costs always, and so that's one of the problems. Not a lot being done to clean that up, unfortunately. Who violates copyright? Well, the test in the act is pretty simple. If you don't have the right to do something and you do something, well, then you're an infringer. Um, so it goes back to the point I was just making. You have to look at all the rights that copyright gives to the various rights holders. If you don't respect those rights and do something without proper authorization, you are then an infringer. There is something called the fair dealing exception. Uh, it's well known. Uh, people talk about this all the time. Well, I can do this. It's fair dealing. Fair dealing is a very narrow exception. It's fair dealing for the purposes of private study or research or news reporting. There are a few other additions. Parity is one that was just added in Bill C-11. It's very narrow. It doesn't mean that any time you want to have private, to do something for private study, that you necessarily can say it's fair dealing. The dealing has got to be fair. That part is often ignored. But there's case law to, suggest, uh, to tell us what fair means. And then you've got to do it for private study. So. If you are, for example, uh, photocopying books uh, from a, or, or you go to the bookstore, I don't know who would do this, but you go to the bookstore with a handheld scanner or an iPhone even these days, and you scan a book in the bookstore, and then you go and you print it up uh, on a, a printer later, and then you say, well, I was for my own private study, so there's no copyright in it. No, you're displacing the original market for that book, which was to sell the book to you for private study, so you might have a problem at that point. So my point is it's got to be fair, and fair depends upon the context. All right, copyrights may be licensed or assigned uh, you know, to others. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the language, think of license as renting out your apartment or your house, and think of assignment as selling it. Um, and you can sell it uh, or assign it, uh, license it, in other words, assign it or, or license it, based on geography based on the specific right. You can say you have the right to uh, dramatize the work, but you have the right to reproduce the work. So I can do split them up. Copyright is very malleable. It's very flexible. And again, uh, which I say in the next point, it's also as a result very complicated. And we've already talked about the music example, uh, which if I had more time would be uh, instructive. So. One of the things about copyright is, for many, many years, for in fact, for the better part of, uh, actually it's been more than a century now, uh, uh, we in Canada have, uh, as with other parts of the world, have found copyright to be a, quite a boring, for the most part, quiet, sleepy act. Um, you know, uh, 20, 30 years ago, copyright lawyers, very few, not terribly exciting. Um, my apologies to tax lawyers, but you kind of probably fit in the bucket with them. Um, this was not a hot area of law. Uh, a lot changed in the last 20 years. Um, and what really changed, or 25 years now, I guess, what really changed was introducing um, computer programs into the ambit of copyrightable works, uh, the explosion of digital technology, the explosion of networks uh, to, to sort of transmit and, and to... Uh, uh, interact with digital works. And so copyright all of a sudden found itself the centerpiece of, of this new world that we live in, in the sense that it defines the system of pr property rights effectively, and I put quotes around that, for uh, the digital era. And so it's become a very exciting and hot place to be. And given social media, given the public's interest in all things digital and networking, right? How much of your day do you spend either looking at a device, dealing with digital content on a screen, whether at work or at home? Um, 
it's important. It plays in a very important part to our, uh, of our workday. It's a very important part of our social activities, interacting with others, our communications. And so as a result, we all have a vested interest. And as a result, the population's appetite for um, interacting on copyright issues is great. Uh, social media makes this possible. And so the effect of that has been that any time a government has come and tried to deal with change or try to change the Copyright Act, there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of interest from industry because copyright is, as I said, if it defines property rights and we're becoming more of an information economy, that's a very important set of rights that are being changed. Um, and if you are a user, it makes up so much of your day, it's costing you more and more. Uh, if you go back 30 years, think about your, uh, what I would call your communication expense. You might have had a cable, you might have had cable TV 30, 35 years ago, you might not. Uh, not everyone did, certainly not everyone did. Uh, and if you had a phone, uh, your, your expense was roughly $12 a month. Okay, that was your, that was your communications expense. You typically had an antenna. If you had cable, you might be paying $20 a month, even adjusted for inflation. Think about the average bill of a family today. Uh, if they have a house, one or two kids, and they've got cell phones for everybody, they've got cable television, they've got an internet connection, they've got wireless data, they've got all sorts of stuff going on, you're talking about hundreds of dollars a month. So the expenses become important. Now you add to that content expenses, and it goes up. Um, so the point is, it's become very difficult to change the Copyright Act, because any time a politician puts his or her neck out to uh, affect a change, um, they get uh, it chopped off, basically, by, by the public. And that's what's been happening. So Bill C-60, uh, by the way, I should back up. I didn't put it in the slide. Canada agreed to a set of copyright reforms for digital works. In other words, to make our legislation more in line with the digital era in 1996. We signed something with a whole bunch of other countries saying we were going to change things and we were going to make it different. Many of the other countries that signed it did do what they signed. We tried, although we were pretty late in trying, we didn't try till 2005, and then that bill failed, and then we tried again in 08, failed, 10, failed, and only in 11, after we've had four bills, so a lot of the topics were hashed out, there was copyright fatigue, even on the part of the public, and we had a majority conservative government, in other words, they could push the legislation through, did we actually get legislation to bring Canada in line with what it signed in 1996? So uh, quite a spectacular divide in, in terms of years. Now, what did that change say? What did it do? That's where I'm going to spend uh, the rest of uh, the session. It's Bill C-11, although it's, it's actually the Copyright Act now. It's, uh, these these uh, uh, elements have, have now passed into law and passed into law last summer. There are a couple of other uh, six points I'm going to deal with. Uh, the six points are technical protection measures, TPMs, in other words, a very hot topic at the time, but has proven to be not terribly interesting now that the law has passed, but it certainly got a lot of the... Uh, uh, it garnered most of the attention in, in the various bills that led up to this one. ISP, search engine and hosting liability, um, you know, can you go after Google for uh, sending out its spiders to sort of crawl your pages and, and download the information and index it and do that? Statutory damages, uh, that has to do with sort of users' rights, uh, um, or at least the users' rights groups. Uh, they wanted to know where they stood in terms of copying one sort of person at home making one copy. Typically, litigation-wise, it was very expensive to go after one person. Statutory damages, the idea there was to change that, uh, but the recent bill has modified that further, pushing it back the other way in favor of users' rights. Format shifting and time shifting might be a surprise to you, but we never really did allow VCR taping in Canada. Uh, you were all infringers. We are all infringers. Uh, in fact, until this bill, if you were DVRing or PVRing, whatever you call it, uh, shows, uh, again, not allowed to do it. There was no exception in the law. There was no case allowing you to do it. Didn't fit fair dealing. Technically, you weren't allowed to do it. Um, unlike the U.S., where they actually had a case very early on from their Supreme Court that did allow this. 
Fair dealing was modified. It was felt to be too narrow. Canada, actually, if you look to the south uh, at comedians, uh, whether it's comedians through the 80s, through the 90s, through the current era, uh, Canada produces a lot of funny people, whether it's Jim Carrey, Russell Peters, whatever. And yet, oddly enough, we never allowed parody or satire uh, to be an exception of copyright. In other words, you couldn't take existing copyrightable material, copyrighted material, and use it to make fun of it. That was sort of funny. So Saturday Night Live here would have been a problem uh, if it were produced here. Uh, just because uh, it was viewed here, no one seemed to care. But point is, they had to deal with a number of those cases in the States in Saturday Night Live's early days. They were all uh, found favorable, and, and parody did exist in the United States, but not up here. Ownership of photographs. I've only put that in there because I went to a number of the copyright um, there were hearings, but really sort of the public proceedings where, uh, you know, Heritage or Industry Canada would go across the country, invite people to make comments, so I would go quietly and sit in the back and just see what kind of people would show up and what they'd say, because it was always good theater. Um, and what you would find would be that the photographers, for some reason, had such a bee in their bonnet that they took up a unnecessarily large amount of the time. Um, they were furious about something, uh, and I knew what it was, uh, and so they actually got their amendments through finally um, in this bill, so I thought it would always, it was fair to kind of give them a bit, uh, a bit of time uh, while I'm up here. Let's talk about technical protection measures. What are they? Mindful of the time. So a TPM is a digital lock. Uh, now, what's a digital lock? Think of encryption or some sort of password protection for content. I think that's about as simple as I can make it. And why is it important? So we've been doing this for a long time. Big deal. Well, what's important is it now has legislative protection in, this, in the Copyright Act so that not only is the underlying work, DVD, whatever protected, but if you employ a technical protection measure, some sort of a lockout system, you know, video games do that a lot, uh, movies do that, uh, DVDs do that rather, if you employ that, then the Act gives that lock itself protection. And you'll see why this has become a bit of a funny business. The, question, the copyright was always about protecting the rights in the work itself. Now we're protecting the rights of the uh, in the lock, not in the work. So if someone creates a lock, the lock is actually given protection. To the point where if you break the lock, even if you don't copy the work, you've still committed an infringement. If you then copy the work, now you've done two things that you shouldn't do. So technical protection measures created a problem for copyright purists who said, listen, this isn't right. Copyright protects, and I should have said this at the outset, the expression of ideas. That's a fundamental, that's almost the most fundamental thing you can say about copyright. It protects the expression of ideas. It doesn't protect the ideas themselves. And so in other words, if you are there trying to access the ideas which are hidden by copyright, and I'll give you a perfect example of this, there are certain things that computer code does. That, so computer code is an expression of some ideas, and the expression is protected. But there are some things that code does that are really just raw ideas that you would want to know as a, a designer of programs that society wants you to know because we haven't protected those. We think it's important that people share ideas. Not that they copy someone else's expression, but that they share ideas. So one of the things is people uh, in the software industry sometimes reverse engineer. They, they, in other words, take somebody's code and they tear it apart and they work it backwards into source code so that they can see what was being done. Not to copy the source code or the object code, but to see what was being done so that they can get some ideas themselves. And the question is, should that be allowed or not? In the United States, it is allowed. We have not had a case here to say it's allowed or not, but it should be allowed because it is about getting at the ideas themselves. If a digital lock now surrounds the code, then you can't break the digital lock to get at the ideas. And so copyright becomes a very, very powerful thing for certain industries. It's a long example. I know it's complicated, and if you haven't followed it, uh, 
um, sorry, <laughs> I can't go through it again, I don't have the time, but just remember that digital locks are in favor of the copy of certain copyright industries. And and they've and as I said at the outset, they were a lightning rod to defeat the previous bills. This was where a lot of the battles were had. And yet, interestingly, though that is now law, nobody has made a fuss about it yet because no one cares. Um, for example, when the iPod first came out, Apple had its AAC file format. They put restrictions on how you could copy that, et cetera. That would have been an example of a technical protection measure. Instead, what happened was people just stopped using that file format. People started using MP3s. Apple quickly saw that, uh-oh, if we don't start supporting MP3s in a big way on our players, then no one's gonna buy them, so we'll support them. But now we have this, our own system, which is locked, and the MP3 system all on our players, so eventually they just said, forget it, we're gonna unlock it. And that seems to be what's happened while the legislation has been going through those four bills. People, the industry has become less interested in technical protection measures. They understand that piracy will get around it. So rather than trying to be, you know, the industry that is putting its fingers in a crumbling dike, which is futile, it's about changing the business model. It's not about trying to protect, uh, trying to protect copying. And so instead you've got the Netflixes of the world that have popped up. And instead of saying, look, you're gonna spend this much on each DVD, $25 to buy it or $6 to rent it, instead it was more worthwhile for everyone to just start copying these things and giving them out to friends and putting them on a hard drive where your friend gives you a hard drive, a terabyte of movies. I mean, some of you have those drives at home. Uh, and uh, you know, now instead, they just said change the business model. For $8 a month, you can have it legally. So people are signing up like crazy. And so TPMs are less interesting. Now I've listed in the slides, uh, which I believe, I think you can download or you have, yeah. So there are some exceptions uh, in there uh, where you are allowed to break a TPM, but they're not ones that are typically going to uh, affect uh, any of you. So I'm not gonna go through them. And those are some of them. ISPs and search, uh, search engines and hosting uh, of content, that was also a bit of an issue. Um, there's a big business in hosting. It's important. Uh, you know, if you are not yourself using the cloud yet, you will. Uh, it's inevitable. Uh, online storage is, is a huge business. Local storage is becoming more of a pain. Um, and so, one of the questions, of course, that comes up to support that industry is, well, if we have infringing content on our servers, can you sue us? Because suing any of you is typically not gonna be that interesting if I'm a copyright holder. But suing, uh, you know, Yahoo, Google, uh, Amazon, someplace where you've got cloud storage, well, that's a little more interesting because they've got deep pockets, et cetera, and, uh, um, they're going to want to settle. Um, they won't typically litigate these things, so why not go after them? That's the strategy. And so, uh, you know, that, uh, that is now not available because what we have said is if you are really a raw host uh, and you don't know what's on your system, you're going to be okay. Similarly, with search engines, the world lives on search engines, right? Nobody remembers a URL anymore. Even if you remember a URL, you don't type it in. I mean, let's face it, no one's gonna WW, no one does that anymore. If you wanna go to a web page, you pop it into your Google, Yahoo, or Bing box at the top of the screen, and it pops it up and then you click. We're, we're into speed, right? We wanna get through things quickly. Um, search engines are very important. Uh, and how does a search engine work? For those of you that don't know, a search engine basically crawls the web, uh, downloads everything it can possibly get its hands on, and then it sort of separates it out, indexes it, et cetera. Now different search engine companies have different ways of doing it. They're proprietary and the algorithms they use to search are proprietary. Uh, that's what's made Google the money that Google has made. Um, and so that's a copy, right? They're making a copy of your page and you didn't authorize them necessarily to make a copy and index it. Now, there's an argument to be made that you put the page up there uh, for people to go and use, and you can say, well, yeah, I did. For people to come and view my page, it didn't mean I wanted Google to download it, dissect it, index it, and do all of that, and make money off of it. 
Um, so now there is an exemption to make that really clear that search engines are, are able to do that. Now, if you're looking for the word search engine and all of this sort of stuff, internet in Canadian legislation and Canadian uh, decisions, you typically don't find it. And why is that? Canada has a, this is sort of a bit of a tangent, Canada has a funny way of saying, we want to remain technologically neutral in our language because the internet might not be the internet one day. We might call it something else. So we're going to call it something different. So we call it new media. Okay, so if you see new media, that means the internet. If you see a search engine, does anyone know what the term is? I think it's an information, loca uh, information resource locator. I think it is something like that. I can't even remember. We have a bad habit of doing that, and we always pick the loser names that never get adopted, and no one knows what they mean. So just so you know, if you're ever pouring through the legislation and you don't find this stuff, it's because it's called something else. All right. Formalized notice and notice regime. So what's that? So in the states, what was happening was people uh, who had cloud services were hosting content for download that was not authorized, films, et cetera. And so the US, when they added uh, or, or amended their legislation to comply with the 1996 uh, WIPO treaties, one of the things they did was they implemented a notice and takedown regime. And the idea here is if you are an ISP or a host and you were sent a notice in the prescribed form saying somebody has uh, you know, unauthorized content that you are hosting and serving, then you have an obligation to take it down. That sounds good in theory. Yeah, makes sense. There's a problem. The problem is, who made the ISP judge and jury on this? How does the ISP know it's unauthorized? They got a notice, but you might be sending them a notice that just because you don't like the person. And so you're trying to interfere with what they're doing. Um, and so the question there is, there's no legal judgment, there's no legal opinion, there's nothing. So it puts the ISP in a very awkward situation. If they don't take it down and they're wrong, they get sued. If they do take it down and they're wrong, they've lost a customer and possibly could get sued. So it creates a very difficult situation. So Canadians saw this, the legislators saw this, and said, no, we're going to have a notice and notice regime, which is what ISPs in Canada have been doing for years anyway, at least the major ones. And a notice and notice regime, and you may yourself have been the recipients of notices if you were on Videotron and you ever sort of, or if you've engaged in movie downloading at a, a certain, you know, and, and have tripped over certain movies, you will get a notice from Videotron saying on such and such a day it was noticed that you did download the Hurt Locker or whatever, and therefore, you know, we're watching, or whatever, we've received a complaint. They don't say we're watching you, but um, because they're not the ones watching you. Somebody else is watching you do that. And they sent Videotron. They figured out where the IP address came from. They sent Videotron a notice, and Videotron forwards you the notice. And the same is true for Bell and Rogers and all the other ISPs. It's a notice and notice regime. The ISP has one obligation. If they receive a notice in the prescribed form, they have to forward it on to the user. Doesn't mean they divulge who you are. They just have to forward it on. They act as a screen. Uh, but that is their obligation. Your identity only gets released with a court order. Non-commercial infringement. So this is what I was talking about. We had a uh, statutory damages regime that was implemented in, I believe, 1997 that talked about basic damages that you could go. Sometimes the damages are so de minimis in a copyright case that it's not worth bringing it, yet you've still had a right and you still uh, that has been infringed and you want to go to court and, and um, avail yourself of, of the justice system. And so they put in place a statutory damages regime that said that there would be minimums and, and maximums, but that you could claim for various infringements certain fixed amounts of money to make it a little more interesting so that you would bring the claim. It never got out of hand at all, yet it created a big amount of discomfort on the part of various users groups who lobbied to get it changed. They did get it changed. And so Canada now has a two-tiered uh, st uh, statutory damages regime. 
one for non-commercial infringement and one for commercial infringement. The commercial infringement stays the same as it used to be. Okay, and that's the one at the bottom, uh, bottom of the screen. $500 to $20,000 per work infringed. That is if it is for commercial use. For non-commercial use, they've changed it dramatically. It used to be um, more or less what was at the bottom, but now what it says is uh, it's $100 to $5,000 per legal proceeding, and the legal proceeding has all the rights, all the works, everything that could possibly. Remember at the beginning I said works can be dissected into various rights and rights holder? No, if you are in a non-commercial statutory damages system, if you are in that system, there is one proceeding that covers everything and the amount is once, okay? So it doesn't multiply out across all the different rights holders and rights that you violated, et cetera. Interesting, I've never seen this done before, is the first to file an elect. The first copyright holder to the courthouse to file the claim against you takes carriage of the claim and that's it. No one else gets to sue you after that, okay? And there is a proportionality regime uh, whereby the court still has the power to modify things, to deviate from the system if it creates unnecessary hardship. So this really is a user's rights sort of bonanza in the sense that for those individuals who were scared that the heavy hand of the copyright industries would sort of drop on you at a certain point, this is a real safety, uh, safety valve for you. Let's talk about format shifting and time shifting. Format shifting is just so prevalent these days. It's part of sort of the DNA of living in the modern digital world. This means when you have a file in one format and you want to convert it to another format. For example, uh, you have uh, a DVD that has uh, a movie on it that's in one format, but you can't watch it because you don't have a DVD player that can read it or whatever. Or you want to watch it on your iPad, and so you want to convert it into um, you know, uh, a QuickTime format for Apple or whatever. You're allowed to now shift the format of uh, the works. Of course, you've got to have the work legally in the first place. Uh, you can't give the reproduction or you can't format shift and then start selling it, obviously. And it's used for private purposes. But that's nice. I think that's a, a recognition of the digital reality we live in. I knew this was coming. My VCR tapings were not uh, necessarily going to be uh, I was not going to be attacked for them, and, and now we have a time-shifting proper exception in the law. It's statutory. It's not case law. Uh, again, you know, you, you've got a cable feed. Um, you want to watch the show at some later time, so now you tape the show. You don't make more than a copy, so you're, in other words, you're not sending it around to everybody. Uh, you keep the copy for no longer than necessary in order to listen to or view the program at a more convenient time. You know, I've never seen the movie Wind Talkers, but I looked on my PVR, it's three years old. I, I will get to it at some point. I just haven't got to it yet. So I'm not sure what convenient time means, but uh, you can't give away the recording. And again, it's private purposes. Now here's the kicker, and this is what got people very upset. But again, it hasn't happened in, a in any real form yet. Technical protection measures may not be circumvented for time shifting or format shifting purposes. In other words, if you buy, in other words, license, but, but you get a recording of your favorite album, I don't know, it's a re-re-re-release of Dark Side of the Moon, um, you know, the 50th anniversary edition or wherever we're at with those guys, um, and it's TPM protected and you want to format shift it onto your iPod, you can't do it. And that sort of says that TPMs frustrate a lot of the rest of the act. And that is another reason that they became a real lightning rod and people got very upset about TPMs. The truth of the matter is no intelligent copyright industry right now is going to abuse that TPM right. Not because they're going to lose the legal case, but they'll lose the case with the public. Uh, the public will not stand for that kind of TPM protection anymore. 
They just won't, and they will flock to alternatives very, very quickly. So I think it's a bit of a red herring. Fair dealing, I talked about this. Uh, for the purposes of education, parody and satire does not infringe copyright. Um, uh, so that was an addition. I think it was welcome and, and waited for. An interesting one, which I, I can't imagine was ever going to be actionable anyway, but to the extent you, uh, for your non-commercial kind of home use, uh, engage in sort of using digital content, which is what's neat about digital content, right? You can take bits and pieces, whether it's songs and you're using samples, or it's art and you're using pieces of different digital works and you're creating something yourself, not a problem. Go nuts. Uh, you can do that. But non-commercial, and, and to the extent uh, you've got to incorporate the source of these, which I always find kind of weird. I'm doing it for home use. I'm not going to start adding like footnotes. Um, but anyway, that's what the law says. Um, and that just continues it. <clears throat> you can't have, and, and this goes back to the first test. If you look at the point, the first test that I mentioned when we were talking about fair dealing, you can't have uh, adverse effects on the exploitation or potential exploitation of the existing work or an existing potential market. That was the example where I said you can't go into Indigo uh, or, or any bookstore with an iPhone and start copying the pages and saying it's all fair dealing for uh, private use. Uh, fair dealing has within it built in, has this particular test built into the, the fairness criteria. And finally, and I can't believe I did this in 45 minutes, we'll talk about the ownership of photographs. Why were the photographers so upset? Why did they have a bee in their bonnet? What was it about? Well, the reality is photographers in Canada had this particular bizarre situation where if you commissioned a photograph of yourself, you owned it, not the ph photographer who spent all the time and effort setting it up. You could always reverse things by contract, but absent a written agreement, you owned it. So I went, I remember my, my wife set us up with the, the kids at, uh, I can't remember, I think it was Majestic or something, I probably shouldn't name them, but it was Magenta? Magenta, whatever, somewhere in the West Island. We went there, they put on Canadian sweaters, took pictures of the kids, you know, whatever, and uh, they, they had nice pictures, um, and, and wildly expensive, um, but, but nice pictures. And at the end, I'm at the, uh, I'm at the desk, uh, you know, um, saying, well, okay, what's the damage? And it's some ungodly sum. And then, of course, they always try to upsell you at that point. And they say, would you like a CD of the photos? At which point, being rather perturbed at the sum that I was ponying up for, um, I said, you're actually going to charge me $100 or whatever it was extra for the CD. I'll just scan them myself. At which point they said, oh, no, you're not allowed to do that. I said, actually, I kind of am. Um, in fact, technically speaking, you don't own the copyright in those photos, and I didn't sign anything that transferred it to you. That's what photographers were upset about. So they got that reversed finally. So now they actually own the, the copyright in the photos that they are commissioned to take. Um, you should hear me in the discussions I have with the people at Future Shop when I'm buying software. <laughs> um, very quickly. Um, there have been, and I'm going to race through this, there have been five Supreme Court cases in the last year on copyright. Now you're like, okay, big deal. No, that's a big deal. <laughs> five Supreme Court copyright cases, that never happens. Uh, in fact, the Supreme Court went for years without touching a copyright case, but they did not only five in the same year, they released all five decisions in the same day. So this was like a copyright smorgasbord for people who cared. Um, very quickly, don't worry about, I'm not going to go through the facts, I just don't have the time, but I want to go through the holdings in the case because they're important to understand the view that the court has now of digital works. So streaming online music previews for sampling by potential purchasers is fair dealing. So you know when you've got iTunes or, or you're at the HMV site or whatever and you want to listen to a sample of a song? So, so can the Collective Rights Society claim that they should be paid every time you listen to a sample, or for the rights, not every time, but there's a blanket license. They wanted to be paid a tariff for sampling of those songs, and the court said, no, that really doesn't work. That's private study and research, you know? I mean, come on. Um, second one, the Copyright Board was, be, was asked to reconsider its unreasonable decision 
that the photocopying by teachers of textbook excerpts for use by students in schools is not fair dealing. In other words, guys, get a grip. You're not gonna grab every last penny for every little thing that happens. If a teacher's copying in a modest way some excerpts from a textbook, not supplanting the use of the book or anything, but just a couple of excerpts, let it go. I like that, reasonableness. Entertainment Software Association, that's the uh, video game um, uh, sort of association. Downloading music is not a communication to the public. What does that mean? It means it's not, a communication to the public is something that is a copyright right. So in other words, if you own the music, you would have the right to authorize or not to authorize that. And if you authorized it, you'd ask for a fee. So in this case, they're saying, no, it's not a communication to the public. Um, as this transmission is simply a more technologically advanced way of providing a copy of the musical work to the public as compared with selling. So what they've recognized here is HMV, all of those CD stores, the DVD stores, the rental, facilities, Blockbuster, those guys are gone or on their way out. Instead, they're being transplanted by a new way of doing things. And to the extent that you are downloading you know, a game, for example, that contains a soundtrack, it's not the same as listening to the radio. I am bringing the entire game to me. I will use it later. Okay, that is not the same as listening to radio. And if you're listening to the radio, a different right is triggered, and that's the communication to the public right. This is not. This is about getting it to you. You might, so now you have a reproduction that you've made. That's a different right. So it's a bit technical, but the idea here, if you have to remember one idea is, the court was smart enough to distinguish downloading from streaming. That's important. But the second question you might ask is, is there really a difference and should there be a difference? That's a policy issue, that's a governmental legislative issue. The next case, they dealt with streaming. And they said streaming music is not a private transa transaction between an online music provider and a member of the public and thus is a communication to the public. So here they're saying streaming is a communication to the public, downloading is not. That's a different thing we're doing. And you can't say now if you're the person doing the streaming that, oh, that was a private communication, there was no public. No, if I, if I put something up for sale, if I put Metric's new album up for sale and five of you downloaded at different times, you can't say each of those was a private transaction. It wasn't. I've made it available to the public. Nice try, but it doesn't work. And, and the same is true for internet, uh, any sort of streaming. If you go to a site and you're watching YouTube, for example, or listening to something that streams, and we're all doing it at a different time because none of us start everything at exactly the same second, uh, those are not private transactions. It's made available to the public, it's streaming to the public. I think, that, again, reasonableness. And this one, uh, oops, sorry, I should have had that slide there for you. Uh, this one, performers and makers of sound recordings are not entitled to equitable remuneration when the soundtracks are featured in a movie or television, or when their sound recordings are featured in movie or uh, television soundtracks. So the idea here was, do we take the CD rules when you release a CD and say that if your stuff is now used in a movie, it's to be treated exactly the same way and it's complicated. That one's probably not as much of a digital issue uh, as the others. Um, and the court said, no, it's nice try again. There's a different set of rules. You don't get to double dip twice uh, to uh, um, resound. Uh, it shouldn't, it, when it says resound, by the way, that's not like, uh, um, a reference, it's not reference, that, that's actually the name of the company, Re Colon Sound, and it's a copyright collective that deals with performers' performances and sound recordings. So I've got about three minutes left. I'm happy to take questions, um, and if there aren't any, well, that's great. I hope you've enjoyed it. <laughs>